All right, hello everyone. And once again, welcome to this afternoon's Twilight Talk brought to you by the Faculty of Science at the University of Queensland. The University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the many lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue co cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Before I introduce myself and our presenter for today, please take note of the following. So that we don't chew up everyone's bandwidth, please may we request that your web cameras are turned off and that your microphones are set to mute. Secondly, if you're new to Zoom, you'll find a little speech bubble icon at the bottom of your screen which says chat. Please click on this and a Zoom group chat should appear on the left hand side of your screen. You can use this throughout today's talk to interact with us and there'll also be a short Q&A session after the presentation so you can drop any questions that you might have during or after the presentation into that and we'll address them then. You should also be paying close attention to the presentation tonight um, as I will be asking some quiz questions at the very end before the Q&A segment and the first of you who answer those questions will get a little prize so make sure that you do pay attention tonight. And with that welcome again. My name is Jenny Evans and I'm an evolutionary biologist at the University of Queensland. I studied at UQ graduating back in 2018 and now I work in the School of Biological Sciences here at UQ uh, primarily in invasive weed species research. I'm going to be your moderator for today. Today's presentation is by Gail Riches on fisheries. For those of you doing uh, senior marine science, this would be highly relevant to what you are learning or about to learn. Gail is a marine ecologist, dive instructor, high school teacher, and founder of Marine Education. She specializes in creating resources for Queensland Year 11 and 12 marine science students. And so this talk will be focusing specifically on content from Unit 4 in the Queensland Marine Science Syllabus. Thank you so much for your time today, Gail, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so today I will be talking about fisheries management and introducing you to some of the key concepts um, that you are learning about in the marine syllabus. Uh, hopefully you may have already started that. Uh, I'll start by sharing my screen though, and then uh, we should be ready to go. Okay. And I'll just get my chat up so I can see anybody. Uh, sorry about this. Chat. Uh, okay, I don't seem to be able to see the chat. So maybe we'll just um, have a look at those uh, comments at the end there. Uh, so there is just one slide that I have um, and I am going to be zooming in to each section so that um, we can see it and talk about it in a little bit more detail. Uh, so in a nutshell, fisheries management is I've separated it into three parts. So first of all, you have the data collection. Uh, which is where we have to find out how many fish there are to start with. Then uh, the stock assessment, where we find out um, how many fish we can sustainably catch. And lastly, uh, the management. So how do we stop people from overfishing and just catching the amount that we think is the sustainable amount. So starting with data collection. First of all, how many fish are there? So there's a couple of ways in which we uh, find out how many fish are in our population. Uh, the one that's used most broadly is uh, getting the information from people who are out there all the time, and that's the fishing vessels. So they all have to keep a logbook of how much they've caught, um, what they're catching, what by catch they're catching, and so on. Uh, and that is converted into what we call catch per unit effort. So, for example, uh, a catch would be 10 fish, and the amount of effort would be in an hour. Um, or, for example, they might catch 100 fish per hour. So the more fish that they catch for the, the same amount of effort, uh, we would assume that the population would be of a larger size. If they're catching less fish in an hour, then we assume that the population is a little bit smaller. So that's one way to estimate how many fish there are in the stock. We sometimes call it unit stock. You'll see that written in some places. Um, 
basically all that means is it's the population, but it's the population of the species that we're targeting. So what commercial species is being targeted in particular is the unit stock, but population is the same thing. Um, the other way we collect data is with scientists on board uh, as observers and uh, also on our own research vessels. So if you do go to UQ uh, and do a degree through UQ and maybe get a research um, profession, then uh, you could be working on a research vessel. So these vessels um, have scientists on board and one of the ways in which we can estimate population size for mobile organisms is to tag them. Um, it's a little bit different when you, you're probably familiar with quad rat sampling. That's great if your animals aren't moving, but as soon as your animals start to move about the place, it, quad rat sampling is a little bit difficult to, to use when estimating population size. So instead we tag them and one of the um, ways in which we estimate popula uh, population size is, uh, is this capture recapture method, which you will have been probably introduced to in your fisheries unit, if not very soon. And basically how that works is uh, we do two catches. The first catch, they tag what they catch. So here in red are your tagged fish. So for example, first catch, they caught six fish and tagged them. They release those fish back into the environment um, to swim around, hopefully not leaving the boundary of that population. And hopefully the tag has not made it uh, hard, harder to catch the second time around or you know, injures it in any sort of way. Then uh, after a period of time, the scientists go back out to the same place with the same amount of effort and catch fish again, and then count how many of those are recaptures. So the, the idea is the more recaptured fish there are um, that are tagged, then the smaller the population. So for example, it works on ratios. So if you have a look at this Lincoln index down the bottom here, uh, in our second catch in, in yellow, we have one tagged fish and three fish caught all together. So the tagged fish is the little m, the number of fish you caught and the second catch is your little n. And so the ratio is one to three. So then we're assuming um, the ratio for the first catch would also be one to three. So if we caught six fish and, and tagged them all, we would be assuming with a ratio of one to three that there would be approximately 18 fish in that population. So once we know how many fish there are, we need to work out um, how we're going to, uh, how many is going to be a safe number to catch sustainably. And so we do that, uh, we've done that for a long time using what we call MSY or maximum sustainable yield. And that is based off this particular graph here. So on the Y axis you have population size and on the X axis you have time. Basically, when your population starts out small, there's only a couple of individuals that are reproducing, making babies. Eventually they grow up and they have babies themselves until you get to the steeper part of the slope, which is where you have lots and lots of adults reproducing. And so the population is growing very quickly. Um, however, eventually what happens is the environment cannot carry that many individuals and so some of them start to die or leave that population. So the population is not growing as fast. It's still growing, but just not as fast as it was when it was uh, quite steep on that slope. Eventually it reaches K, which is called our carrying capacity. You may have seen that. Um, and that is the maximum size in which the population can grow for that particular environment. So maximum sustainable yield is our magic number of fish that we would assume is a sustainable amount to catch from our population size estimate. So having a look now at this graph here on the uh, Y axis, we have population growth rate and on the uh, sorry, and on the X axis, we have our population size. If you compare the two graphs, um, maximum sustainable yield is when the population is growing at its fastest rate. So because we have on the Y axis, the growth rate, uh, maximum sustainable yield is at the very top of this curve. So here we have the population growing in size, it reaches its maximum growth rate, and then eventually it still keeps growing in size, but 
some of the fish are dying and, and leaving the population until they reach K at this point here. Um, so the idea is that the harvested stock, so the fish that are caught, are quickly replaced in the fastest amount of time when at the maximum sustainable yield, because that is half of K, it's the fastest birth rate and the fastest population growth rate. Um, so that was our magic number. That's how many uh, fish would be sustainable amount to catch until we bring into the equation economics. So even though we could catch that many fish, it's actually economically better off to be catching a little bit less, which is a bit of a win-win, win-win for us, win-win for the fish. And that brings me to this, uh, this graph down the bottom here. So here we have revenue and cost, which is your money on the y-axis and fishing effort on the x-axis. Uh, the yellow is revenue. So this is how much money you make after you've sold your fish at the market. And the blue is your costs. So how much it costs to actually catch those fish. Now we're looking at uh, the fishery as a whole, not just one particular operator. Um, Assuming that as fishing effort increases, your costs increase, which is generally the case, then um, what's going to happen is initially, there'll be people fishing, they'll be catching lots of fish, they'll be making some money at the, at the markets, but eventually the fish will start to decrease. Uh, you won't have as many fish anymore because you're catching them, and but your costs are still gonna be going up. So you break even at about this this spot here where the uh, the blue line, the blue arrow intercepts the revenue line. Anything below this area, you're losing money and anything above the blue line, you are getting money. Now the difference between maximum economic yield and maximum sustainable yield is the, 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 the height of these dotted lines here. Now it's probably hard to see on this, but this uh, dotted line under MEY is longer than the dotted line under MSY. And what that means is there at maximum economic yield, MEY, is the greatest distance between how much it costs you to catch the fish and how much you're making at the market in revenue. So you're actually, the fishery as a whole is making a lot more money uh, if they're catching less fish, which is fantastic. Um, I'm going to just stop sharing the screen now though and put a question to you so I can see the chat. Uh, the question is, how do we make sure the level of fishing effort stays at or below MEY? So if you want to try and uh, answer that question by putting a few um, comments in the, in the chat section, that would be awesome. Bag limits, thank you, Jared. I'll give it about a minute. Any other suggestions? So just have a think about um, what, what could you do to make sure that people don't go out and catch more than you've said is a safe amount to catch. Okay, Hope says keeping, oh, quotas from Chris, excellent. Hope says keeping on top of regulations by continuum monitoring by management, fines as needed, excellent. Green zones, marine protected areas, limited fishing area, awesome. That's great. All of those things we're gonna be talking in just a moment. Fantastic. All right, I'll go back to sharing my screen. And let's just move on now to the third section of this talk, which is management. Uh, hide. I'm just going to try and get rid of that. There we go. So uh, how do we stop people from overfishing? We, we have a rough estimate of how many fish uh, there are in the unit stock or in the population. We have estimated how many fish are going to be a sustainable number to catch at our maximum economic yield. And now we need to figure out how to make sure that 
people don't fish over that magic number. And you'll probably find when you're doing your studies that uh, fisheries management is, is much more about managing people uh, than it is the fish. So this part, we're looking into more of the social science side of things. Um, there's two, two controls, uh, types of controls that uh, management authorities use to be able to uh, make sure that people aren't overfishing. Input controls are the, the, the rules and regulations that are put in place before the fish are caught. So that could be in the way of licenses, gear restrictions, taxes and closures. Um, output controls, generally speaking, is after the fish have been caught. So selectivity criteria you may have heard, um, you know, when you go fishing, you can't catch fish over a certain size or, or if they're too small, you have to give them back. Um, the age <coughs> is usually associated with the size. The gender of the fish, it, you know, might have to put all the females back. Landing fees, which you get hit up when you come back into port and total allowable catch and quotas. I'm gonna speak a little bit more in detail about now because that does come up in the syllabus quite a bit. So total allowable catch is exactly what it says. It's the total allowable catch that people can catch. And that is based on either the maximum sustainable yield or the maximum economic yield. So that's our, and the number of fish that, that are allowed to be caught. Um, and to stop people from racing to catch all those fish, we have quotas. So for example, on the left here, where we have a total allowable catch of four fish. Let's assume each fish is worth 25,000 each. Pretty good fish. Um, and just as one quota, we give that all to one operator and that one operator can catch all four fish and make $100,000. Or is it better off to get our four fish and split it into four quotas so that you can have four operators now getting $25,000 each. Now the quotas are either allocated by the government authority or um, auctioned. So the authority says we have uh, four quotas, um, you go for it and bid whatever you wanna pay for, for each quota. And those quotas help to stop racing, people racing to catch the fish. Uh, who is making and enforcing all the rules? This is what we call governance. Governance is, is governing the fishery. So those, whoever's in charge of making the rules and, and making sure everyone's doing the right thing. Uh, there's a few different ways that governance can happen. Top down is when you have a, an authoritative figure. Um, such as a government um, making the rules and then everybody else has to comply or you get fined. That's generally what we do in Australia. Um, you can have bottom-up governance, which works in smaller island communities where they don't have an, a big authority figure or they would rather manage it themselves. So that's the, the rules and regulations are coming up from the bottom, from the community, from the people on the ground themselves. You can have a co-management situation where it's a bit of both. The government gives money and, and resources and research and the people then drive that. Um, and for places where, uh, in the high seas, where no one really owns the ocean, we have what we call RFMOs, or Regional Fisheries Management Organisations. And it's basically the countries who have an invested interest in a particular fish stock come together and have meetings and agree on um, how they're going to manage that particular fishery. All of these things get put into what we call a fisheries management plan. So all of our strategies, in which case, there are a few different ways of, of managing a fishery. Um, the, the way that we've done it for a very long time has been single species fisheries management, um, whereby we are just estimating the population size of that particular species that we're interested in fishing for. Um, and putting in our rules and regulations from there. It is, however, sort of moving now into the realm of ecosystem-based fisheries management. And this is where you're not just looking at the one target fish, but you're also looking at uh, the environment in which it lives in, in which it needs to survive and reproduce. So the predators, the prey, its habitat, connectivity, all that sort of stuff. Um, it is difficult to be able to measure all of those things. The amount of interactions that a particular fish species has with its environment is, is massive. Um, and so 
if there is not enough scientific data, then the precautionary principle applies. So that's definitely in Australia. Um, and so the precautionary principle is when you don't have enough scientific information to be sure about a decision that you need to make, then you have to put in place precautionary measures to make sure that nothing's going to go completely wrong. Um, and to be able to manage an entire ecosystem, uh, one of two, two popular ways of doing that is through uh, MPAs or marine protected areas and reducing bycatch. So MPAs, um, we'll, we'll talk about it in a moment, but bycatch is any of the catch of discards that a fishery has where they've caught something and they didn't particularly want to catch it. They weren't targeting it. So it might be someone um, out there fishing for prawns and they accidentally pull up some rays and sharks in their nets. So that's, that's bycatch. And we're trying to reduce the amount of bycatch as much as we possibly can to look after the environment, which would then look after that particular species. Um, MPAs, it, uh, there's lots of different types of MPAs. There's lots of different rules and regulations, but generally speaking, an MPA is an area that is protected. Um, and the idea is that you're going to protect those areas so that the fish can reproduce and, and increase in numbers. And so just outside the boundaries of that MPA, the fishermen can still fish and catch what we call the spillover effect. So if the fish, they don't know where the boundaries are. And so they swim in and out of the MPA and you end up having uh, a lot more fish at the end of the day. So again, if you're doing uh, a degree or something like that, you could go into studying that. There's lots of research about the advantages of MPA, but they're only good if they are designed well. If they're not designed well, people do not like being told they can't fish somewhere and when the fish aren't increasing in numbers at the same time. So if they, they need to be designed well, which is why the, I think the syllabus has focused a lot on how do you design an MPA well? And the criteria to do that, you have to pick the right sites, networking and connectivity. The fish need to be able to access all the habitats that they need to carry out their life cycle. Replication, so you need more than one. Spacing, if you've got more than one, how far apart are they going to be? And the size and coverage, so how much area are you actually going to, to, to zone out? Um, then uh, there is one more thing that the syllabus does mention, and that is dynamic spatial zoning fish management. And I'm aware of time. So um, what this is, is uh, obviously the fish are fish and they swim and so they move. Um, so if you have an MPA just in a stationary position, it can be ineffective. What is even better is if you can actually get that marine protected area to move with the fish. So for this particular um, management strategy, it's called dynamic, which means moving, spatial is in space, zoning is rules and regulations. Fish is usually your, the fish that you're trying to, that are endangered or you're trying to protect. And management is an ecosystem-based fisheries management strategy. So basically what happens is um, the fishermen are out there, they record where the fish are being protected are found. It might even be turtles or something, you know, whales or dolphins or, or a particular shark species or bluefin tuna. Um, and they have habitat maps. So we sort of try and track where these fish are and wherever they are, we try to make it so that uh, they are protected in those spaces at that time. So it's, it's a real time thing and it's not as popular just yet, but it is gaining in popularity. So I just wanted to, to touch on that um, so that you're aware of what that is when you get to that part in the syllabus. And that's about it. I'm going to just uh, get out of that. So that's the whole thing. If you want a copy of that, um, just email me um, or, you know, you can find my email on marineeducation.com.au and I can send you the PDF and you can print it and laminate it, put it in your classroom if you wish. So there you go. I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Jennifer. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Gail. Um, and just as a heads up to everyone as well, we will be recording or we have been recording tonight's session. So we'll be making that available to everyone as well. Um, before we get into the Q&A section of this, we've got a little quiz now. So I have a couple of questions that I wrote down during the talk. And what we'll be doing is getting you guys to just throw some answers in the chat so then I can see who answered first. Um, whoever does 
I'll be dropping an email for one of our UQ staff members in the chat afterwards. And if you shoot them an email, you can collect your prize through that. So the very first question is, what is a common method that research vessels use to estimate population size? Yep, the recapture was what I was looking for. So we might give that one to Jolene. I'll bow to Gail's superior knowledge. So if she thinks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all good. Awesome. So well done on that, Jolene. Uh, and then the second question is, what does the maximum uh, sustainable yield mean in terms of population growth? Ooh. Almost Winnie. Really? Not quite. There's a, Ooh. yeah, we'll give it to Winnie then. <laughs> Yeah, it's the fastest population growth rate. So awesome. So Winnie and Jolene, if you guys shoot an email through to the email I've just put in the chat, um, you'll be able to collect your prize through that. So thank you very much for participating, everyone. Um, and we'll open the floor to any questions for Gail. Uh, so if you have any follow-ups from the talk today, feel free to put them in. If you have any other wildcard questions, um, and we'll have a look at those as they come in. And maybe while we wait for the first one, Gail, I actually have a very quick question. Mm -hmm. um, is there any environmental benefit in or ne positives and negatives in the way that you distribute your quotas in fisheries? So is there any benefit to having like all just one person fishing an area ah, or lots of, yeah, lots of smaller catches going on? Yeah, that's that's a good discussion point. That is, uh, there's 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 two sides to that. One is uh, if we give it to just a couple of operators, big operators, um, super drawlers, won't say that word. Uh, <laughs> but if you give it to just a couple of operators, which is kind of what they're trying to do um, in Australia at the moment, then it, it just means that it's easy to monitor because um, you've only got a couple of people to monitor um, and you can make sure that, you know, you're getting all the right information. However, it does kind of, you know, it's a little bit controversial because then you've got all your mum and dad fishing operators and, you know, they've been doing it for their whole life. And and so, you know, how, 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 do, you, you know, how do you tell them that they can't fish anymore because yeah. they've been priced out of, out of it? So, yeah, that's a really good question. Very controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Aside from the human perspective on that, is there also... Yeah. An In environmental like, one, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's all good. So environmentally, it's better off if you just have a couple of operators um, for the simple fact that um, that it's easy to monitor um, mm. and and uh, and enforce and regulate and all that sort of stuff. So environmentally, however, however, oh, if you pop in <laughs> super trawlers and you know taking large amounts, it de it depends on how many that they're allowed to take. It depends on uh, how good the population estimates are and the modelling is. So, for example, if you're looking at uh, the krill down in Antarctica. Um, the, the population estimates are a little bit hard to get because the krill tend to school together and so it's easy mm. to overestimate the population and then you've got to put into that climate change and how that's going to affect the population. And so the, 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 catch, the, the quotas and the total allowable catch for krill is really, really high in comparison to how many we actually do catch and that's a little bit worrying because we're like, well, maybe if we allow people to catch more, it might just not be a good idea so so you know from an environmental perspective then it's better to have lots of little operators so i don't, I don't know the answer to it's a complicated question <laughs> sorry for throwing that at you oh, it's a good one though it's a really good one um i can't see any other questions coming in in the chat we might just give it a more little bit more time <laughs> yeah apparently <laughs> All right, we might just call it there then. Thank you so much for today, Gail. It was absolutely wonderful to hear you speak and thank you everyone for coming along. Um, just a reminder that there are also a few other Twilight Talks happening for the rest of June. So make sure that you do have a look at the ones that are coming up. But otherwise, thank you all for your time tonight. 
have a wonderful evening and we'll see you later. Thank you. See ya. <laughs>